Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the last session for day one of the workshop. Uh, we'll begin with session three uh, that's going to focus on mechanistic modeling of other locally acting generic drug products. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Andrew to introduce the speakers for session three. Session three for mechanistic modeling of other locally acting generic drug products has three speakers today. In order of presentation, Mili Antan, PhD, is a staff fellow at the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling, Office of Research and Standards, OGD. Dr. Tan's main in research interests include PVK modeling simulation with a focus on the area of locally acting complex products such as ophthalmic drug products. Sajeev Chandran, PhD, is the Director of Advanced Drug Delivery Research and IVIVC at Lupin. Dr. Chandran is involved in leading the diverse research group of formulators, analysts, biopharmaceutics, and IV IVIVC experts in design, development, and regulatory submission of advanced drug delivery technologies. Rebecca Jareb is a scientist in clinical development at, San at Sandoz Development Center and has expertise in PVK modeling and IVIVC IVIVR for regulatory purposes. The moderators today are myself, Andrew Abiskin, PhD, and Maxim Lamerde, PhD. Dr. Babiskin holds the position of team leader for the locally active PVA team in the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling Office of Research and Standards, OGD. Dr. Lamerity is a senior scientist at Simulations Plus. Dr. Lamerity has expertise in PVK models for locally acting drug products and has published multiple papers on ocular delivery models. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Min Liang Tan. I'm a staff fellow in the Division of Quantitative Method and Modeling, Office of Research and Standards, OGD. It is my great pleasure to give a talk in this session. My talk will be focusing on Kudufa research update on mechanistic modeling approaches for generic ophthalmic, nasal, implant, and injectable drug product. To support generic drug product development and the regulatory decision making, OGD has implemented GUDUFA research program by collaborating with the FDA as well as externally through grants and a contract. Internally, FDA performs some internal research to meet the regulatory scientific needs. Externally, research grants and the contract are launched regularly. These external research opportunities can be found through the link given here. My talk will start with physiologically based pharmacokinetics or PPPK modelings for ophthalmic drug products followed by PBPK modeling approach for nasal drug products, the model integrated evidence approach for complex injectables, modeling approach for buccal sublingual products, and finally, PBPK models for complex products delivered in female reproductive tract. In terms of ophthalmic generic products, Let's first take a look at the data from a recent publication by my colleagues, as shown in this table, which summarizes the numbers of reference products, or RLD, and approved generics on the US market in terms of different dosage forms. As you may see from the table, we are doing pretty good for the generic ophthalmic solution products, where more than 50% of the RLDs have approved the generic products available. However, for the complex formulations such as suspensions, ointments, and the emulsions, we still have a long way to go. First, let's take a look at the ophthalmic suspensions. One internal project was the application of our previously developed and verified ocular suspension PBPK model to study formulation effect on exposure with a focus on T3 
tier dynamics impact on elimination with three different particle size distributions. Non-linearity of PK with three different strengths. We also studied the effect of viscosity on the dexamethasone distributions in ocular tissues and the plasma. Suspension and the solution formulation effect on exposure. This study demonstrated that solid particles presented in a suspension can not only help to achieve a higher ocular exposure, but also unfavorably raise systemic exposure. For ointment formulations, one research contract was awarded to Simulations Plus to simulate ocular ointment formulations where dexamethasone and fluoromethalone ointment rapid models were developed and verified. Parameter sensitivity analysis was performed to understand the impact of ointment formulation changes on ocular exposure. For ocular emulsion formulations, we have performed an internal project on the cyclosporin emulsion modeling. The purpose was to study the impact of emulsion critical quality attributes on product performance. Two internally built models have been built to study the impact of surface tension, osmolarity, and the viscosity on bioavailability and the tear film breakup time. In the meantime, we also have an external research project with CFDRC to develop tear film models by including accurate eye anatomy and the eye blink dynamics in the models to simulate drug delivery and the transport. This 3D tear film modeling results are in line with our internal modeling work, as mentioned in the previous slide. Further model validation is underway through internal and external collaborations. Internally, OTR in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality has successfully manufactured five formulations with the desired globule sizes and the viscosities. Externally, the absorption systems is applying the prepared formulations to rub it to measure tear film and the tear film meniscal thickness in rubbing. In addition to the PK models as mentioned above, we also have some internal research effort on developing PBPK PD models to correlate the changes of brinzolamide of domical suspensions to PK and then PD effect. The model verification is pending on the data through internal and external collaborations. Internally, OTR has manufactured six suspension formulations with the desired particle sizes and the viscosities. Externally, the manufactured formulations have been shipped to absorption systems for animal studies. Another external project is to develop rapid PBPK PD models and then extrapolate rapid models to human for ophthalmic products through a grant with CFDRC. So far, some PK and PD models have been implemented. Here is an example of Tamilo rapid models. In terms of the extrapolation of preclinical model to human, there is also another ongoing external research grant awarded to Simulations Plus. The main focus of this project is to develop and validate PBPK PD modeling strategy to support translation from preclinical species to human for ophthalmic drug products by determining likely physiological differences between rabbit and human, mechanistically extrapolating rabbit models to human models 
and then validating the extrapolated human models and ultimately improving the human model prediction. For the natural drug products, or NDPs, our office has funded eight external grants and the contracts, where six of them are currently ongoing, which includes in vivo, in vitro, and in clinical research. The in clinical studies have two primary goals to start the inference of the device and the formulation differences on regional deposition and absorption, and to predict the olfactory region absorption for nodes to brain delivery. One of the in clinical approaches was computational fluid dynamics, or CFD which can be used to predict the influence of device and the formulation parameters, such as particle size distribution, spray angle, and the spray velocity. CFD models can predict the regional deposition by considering the intersubjective variability. Another application of CFD modeling is to combine the CFD models with the PBPK modeling to predict the PK profiles. In terms of PBPK modeling for laser drug products, a compartment model approach is used to predict local systemic PK by modeling dissolution in mucous layer, absorption through nasal tissue, metabolism in nasal tissue, and then integrate it with the systemic model. These models can typically be validated with in vivo PK data. In the buckle sublingual drug products area, one contract was awarded to St. Louis College of Pharmacy, where their research is focused on assessing the effect of formulation excipients on API permeability in presence of artificial saliva by utilizing two separate similar models. Correlating atomic and the molecular descriptor of the API with the experimental permeability data developing a dynamic in vitro dissolution and the absorption model, or DIV, DAM. Finally, establishing a in vitro in vivo relationship between DIV, DAM originated data and the deconvoluted clinical PK data. In terms of complex injectable area, one contract was awarded to Institute of Quantitative Systems Pharmacology using model integrated evidence or MIE approach. The research project aimed to utilize in silico systems based art scale modeling approach to capture the various biological and the physical chemical events that affect the transport and the residence of narrow particles and its cargo API. To measure the narrow particle and the API specific model parameters through a series of in vitro experiment. To identify and specify formulation critical quality attribute or CQA and the long CQA using model integrated evidence approach. And finally, to validate the models and verify CKAs and their specifications. This figure demonstrates the preliminary structure of a multi scale model to describe subsimilar to systemic spatial temporal events. To improve understanding of narrow particle disposition in human body, to predict narrow particle bioavailability and its cargo API in target site, and to identify boundary condition or safe space of CQS to ensure equivalent target site and bioavailability for two drug products. 
Another research contract was awarded to the University at Buffalo to develop PDPK models for complex products delivered in female reproductive tract. The purpose of this research is to develop an open source, user-friendly, generalized PDPK modeling and simulation platform, which contains collecting available information from literature and the previous modeling efforts, conducting several in vitro, in vivo, and ex vivo studies to fill knowledge gaps, and developing and validating PBPK models. In summary, demonstrating bioequivalence for locally acting drug products may be challenging as measurement of drug concentrations at the site of action in humans may not be feasible. On the other hand, PBPK modeling approach can integrate human physiology, drug and drug product properties, existing in vitro and in vivo data together, which may be used to have a mechanistic understanding of drug absorption and disposition to bridge the knowledge gaps in generic drug development and assessment, and ultimately be utilized in regulatory submissions. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues at ORS OGD and OTR OPCO. Special thanks to Drs. Ross Wallinger, Kundukar Alam, and Mark Donnelly for providing slides for the project they have managed. I would also like to acknowledge all the external grantees and the contractors as listed here. Thank you all for your attention, and I may answer questions you may have during the panel discussion. Hello, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mingliang, for so nicely setting up the context. Carrying forward this discussion, I would be talking on some of the current scientific considerations involved in modeling for in vitro B of topically administered ophthalmic formulations. The learning objectives here would be uh, to examine the anatomical and physiological barriers that exist to topical drug delivery to the eye, some of the formulation variables that influence the barriers to drug diffusion in the precorneal and the corneal space, especially in the context of ophthalmic suspensions and emulsion, and the scientific considerations that are required to be considered while establishing in vitro B for uh, such topical formulations. Diseases of the eye require drug delivery to the anterior and posterior segment. By virtue of eye being relatively secluded from systemic circulation, it presents itself with a variety of anatomical and physiological barriers. The challenge before any dosage form intended for ophthalmic use is to circumvent these protective barriers of eye and at the same time not to cause any irreversible tissue damage. Unlike other organs and routes of administration where collecting biological fluids and tissue samples is relatively easy and therefore establishing the pharmacokinetics of the drug is possible. In case of eye, obtaining live human eye tissue samples is impossible. For this reason, the ocular disposition kinetics of ophthalmic drugs used in human is relatively incomplete and, all, and mostly based on empirical models developed from animal studies and in vitro studies. Of all the, all the options available for drug delivery to the eye, topical drug delivery is the most popular but severely constrained option. Less than 5 to 10 percent of topically applied doses actually absorbed into the anterior segment of the eye. As mentioned earlier, there are several static and dynamic ocular barriers that limit ocular drug bioavailability. While the blood aqueous, the blood retinal and blood vitreous barrier constrain drug delivery to the posterior segment, drug delivery to the anterior segment of the eye is severely constrained by the tear film barrier and the corneal barrier. In the context of this talk, we will restrict our discussion to tear film and cornea.
Human lacrimal system is designed to provide continuous supply of tear over the outer eye globe with excess tear flowing into the nasolacrimal duct. Under normal condition, outer surface of the eye has approximately 7 microliter of tear, which forms a 3 micron thick layer over the surface. The 3 micron thick layer is unique in its structure with the inner aqueous layer sandwiched between the outer lipid layer and the inner mucin layer. We human being blink at 12 to 15 times a minute, which results in a tear turnover of around 16% per minute. So while the primary function of tear is to provide protection and lubrication to the eye, in response to external stimuli like administration of a topical drop, the eye react with excess tear turnover and blinking. This results in washing away of the externally administered formulation or any other foreign particle, essentially resulting in a very steep flip-flop tear drug concentration profile wherein transiently the drug concentration goes up with rapid tear drainage and lacrimation resulting in drop in the drug concentration in the tear fluid very rapidly with a long period of underdosing. Human cornea is composed of five layers with providing resistance to varying degree to hydrophilic and hydrophobic material. The outer layer of the cornea is highly lipophilic in nature, whereas the inner, the thickest layer of the cornea is highly hydrophilic. So a molecule that is required to partition across the cornea into the aqueous humor need to have an optimal lipophilic hydrophilic balance so that it can optimally partition across the hydrophobic epithelial portion of the cornea and the, the hydrophilic stromal portion of the cornea. Based on the discussion so far, let's summarize the impact of some of the static and dynamic barriers associated with tear fluid and cornea on commonly employed topical ophthalmic formulations. Reflex blinking and rapid tear turnover results in drainage of the formulation from the cul de sac, which is an unproductive loss of the administered formulation. Whereas for drainage of the formulation into the nasolacrimal duct may result in systemic absorption, causing unwanted side effect, especially with steroid or beta blocker like formulations. Partitioning of the drug through the cornea require a very optimal lock p value such that the drug is able to circumvent the hydrophobic epithelial layer and, and the hydrophilic stromal layer before it can partition into the aqueous humor. Tear fluid because of its trilamellar structure present with a unique barrier in terms of miscibility of the aqueous vehicle of the ophthalmic formulations and also the solubilization rate of oil globules or so micellar solubilized drug molecules. So formulations manufactured using different manufacturing techniques could have different drug particle size, viscosity, oil globule size, drugs solubilized in the surfactant phase and and the content of drug present in the aqueous phase of the formulation and which essentially can have difference in tear fluid miscibility and solubilization and also partitioning across the cornea. In case of ophthalmic suspension, the two most important quality attributes are the drug particle size distribution and dispersion viscosity. These two parameters are to a great extent influenced by the process variable employed like the mill type or the micronization technique selected, bead size and the quantity of bead employed, number of milling cycle required to achieve the desired particle size distribution. Two quality attributes also influence the in vivo performance of the suspension in terms of the ocular surface retention, drug release characteristics into the tear fluid and the partitioning of the molecule into the corneal membrane. Particle size distribution and dispersion viscosity also influence the suspension's physical stability in terms of its redispersibility, crystal habit and crystal growth, percentage of soluble fraction of the drug in the suspension vehicle. 
To illustrate the effect of particle size distribution, I quote here a study on dexamethasone ophthalmic suspension, wherein three different uh, suspension of the molecule with mean particle size varying from 5.75 micron to 22 micron was employed to study its effect on ocular bioavailability. It was observed that increase in particle size decreased the rate and extent of drug penetration into the corneal membrane and also subsequently resulted in lower aqueous humor drug bioavailability. Presumably, increase in particle size decreased the rate of in vivo dissolution, thereby increasing or enhancing the rate of conjunctival clearance of the, of the product before the dissolution is complete. Higher particle size of the molecule would have also contributed to more rapid tear drainage and unproductive loss of the formulation. Chorup Hannon and co-workers recently reported the interaction of viscosity and particle size on the bioavailability of endometrism ophthalmic suspension. They designed two sets of ophthalmic suspension of endometrism. The first one with smaller drug particle size range but employing three different viscosity grades of HPMC from starting from 1.5 CPS to 15 CPS. The second set of suspensions were manufactured using higher particle size range API and again with the same three different grades of HPMC. They reported that the tear concentration of the drug from these formulation was inversely related to the particle size employed but directly related to the a viscosity of the HPMC employed in the formulation. Higher tear concentration observed in case of formulation manufactured with lower drug particle size with higher viscosity of HPMC. Similar results were obtained for the aqueous humor drug concentration profile where higher drug levels were seen with formulation manufactured using lower particle size range API and a higher viscosity of the HPMC. Increased viscosity of HPMC increased the extent of drug absorption from the formulation by providing longer duration of ocular retention on the precorneal surface and also acting as a, a, a transient reservoir for drug permeation across the corneal membrane. Ophthalmic microemulsions are much complex dosage form with multiple components and drug distribution possible into various phases and components of the emulsion. While the surfactant in addition to be present in the interface between the oil globule and the aqueous phase could also migrate into the aqueous phase to form micellar core. Drug in addition to be present in the oil globules could also be present in the micellar core or in the palisade layer of the surfactant. Drug could also be solubilized in the aqueous phase and also in the surfactant monolayer of the oil water interface. The portion of the drug in each of the phase don't only depends upon the components physicochemical property but also on the manufacturing process employed. These emulsions also employ carbomer as viscosity enhancing polymer which is highly iron sensitive. On coming in contact with the tear fluid it rapidly loses its viscosity thereby breaking the emulsion. The dilution and the action of the salt is expected to further break apart the surfactant stabilized globules and the missiles essentially resulting in a biphasic release profile with initial rapid release caused by drug diffusion from aqueous phase into the micelles to bulk media followed by a very slow release due to drug diffusion from the oil globules. Ophthalmic microemulsions have very short precorneal residence time. The thin film form depletes very rapidly with time. They exhibit biphasic release pattern and they are also shown to be sensitive to temperature change. As the temperature of the microemulsion is raised from its storage temperature to the ocular surface temperature of 35 degrees centigrade, in case of cyclosporin emulsion, the release rate decreases primarily due to the fact that the cyclosporin solubility in the oil globule increases, thereby retarding the drug release. A reverse phenomena is observed in case of diproplanate emulsion where with increase in temperature 
uh, more rapid release is observed. To appropriately capture these observation, it is imperative that we have separate set of static and kinetic responses for comparing emulsions manufactured by different manufacturing processes. Some of the factors impacting contact time in the precorneal region would include the globule size and surface area and the distribution of the globule size, formulation viscosity, surface interactions, distribution of drug in different phases of the formulation, some of the tier related parameters like pH and osmolarity. Factors impacting drug transfer from the formulation to the ocular tissue would include the initial distribution of drug in different components of the emulsion, release kinetics from the globule phase, and the response of the emulsion to ocular surface temperature and rapid tear turnover and the dilution caused by the rapid increase in tear volume. Therefore, in vivo equivalence between two formulation is dependent on similarity of static responses like distribution of drug in different phases, D50 and span of globules or drug particle viscosity as a function of applied shear and some of the kinetic responses that determine how formulation would respond to in vivo precorneal and corneal barriers. So an ideal IVRT method should be able to expose the formulation to the perturbation from the stored state that are similar in magnitude and time scale to in vivo perturbations. The attributes of IVRT method that need to be researched are selection of the IVRT apparatus, the selection of media and its volume, selection of sample volume, selection of surfactants, ability of the surfactant to enhance the solubility of the drug and maintain a sink condition, the temperature employed for the test, also the rotation speed and the agitation employed. In summary, goal of an ideal in vitro release technique would be to obtain in vitro release data in time frame similar to ocular residence time and also be able to simulate the in vivo precorneal fluid dynamics accurately. That's all I had planned to talk. Thank you all. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for taking time to listen to my talk. I'm going to talk about PBPK modeling for different locally administered drug products. The opinions expressed herein are solely mine and do not represent statements or opinions of Lake Pharmaceuticals, Sando Pharmaceuticals or Novartis. Locally administered drug products can be administered via multiple non-oral routes, each having a specific advantage compared to others and to oral administration. You've heard a lot about mechanistic modeling of inhalation and dermal drug products in previous sessions. Other possible routes are ocular, nasal administration into oral cavity, intramuscular, subcutaneous, etc. In this session, I'm going to focus on mechanistic PBPK models for ocular administration and intramuscular injection. There are commercially available PBPK models, for example, in Gastroplus and SimSip, also for other routes, which are marked in blue in this slide. For intratecal, rectal, and vaginal applications, these haven't been developed yet in the mentioned softwares. However, I believe they will be available in the future. First, let's look at the intramuscular injection. Drug products for intramuscular injection can be in the form of a solution, a suspension, or some kind of a long-acting injectable, for example, in situ forming the pose or oil base formulations. In a mechanistic model, a muscle is usually represented as a single compartment with specified drug-dependent parameters, such as solubility or log P, and physiological parameters such as blood flow and fluid volume. From the muscle, the drug can be absorbed into the systemic circulation or into the lymph. Drug can also be bound and in some cases, local metabolism can occur in the muscle. 
Similar to the oral administration, the drug substance has to dissolve in order to be absorbed. After intramuscular injection, the injected substance can cause an immune response and the inflamed tissue can represent an additional barrier to the absorption of the drug from the muscle into the systemic circulation. The case I'm going to present is the model developed for an oily solution of API. The goal of the modeling exercise was to predict the in vivo behavior and bioequivalence of the test formulation and RLD. First, all relevant literature data on API properties was collected, including all available plasma concentration profiles after administration of the API in any formulation, including intravenous. Then, we tried to develop a model in GastroPlus. The first challenge we had was to decide which dosage form to select. A solution and suspension formulations in GastroPlus assumed that the solvent is an aqueous medium and we had an oily solution. One option would be to select a controlled release formulation. To make the decision easier, we asked ourselves what is affecting in vivo behavior of oily drug solutions. This is the concentration of the API in the oil, the thickness of the diffusion layer and the diffusion coefficient in both the oily and aqueous phases, the partition coefficient between the oil and tissue fluid, and the surface of the depot area. The surface is affected by the injection volume, the spreading of the oil within, within the muscle and its distribution and absorption. Most of these parameters are not easy to be measured. However, they are important for the prediction of the difference between the test and reference formulations and would be an important input for the model. Therefore, we decided to develop an in vitro release test which would be able to include most of these parameters and therefore capture the difference between the test and reference and to include the results of this in vitro test into the model, we decided to go with the controlled release dosage form. First, we performed the convolution of the in vivo plasma concentration profile after intramuscular injection. The percent absorbed versus time in days is presented on the figure on the right. We realized that the absorption phase is very long. 80% of the drug is absorbed in approximately three months. Therefore, we faced another challenge. That is, there was no in vitro test long enough to directly capture this in vivo behavior. We developed a three-day in vitro test and decided to include some time scaling in order for the in vitro release test profile to be included in the model as an in vivo release profile. An example of in vitro release profile is presented on the lower figure on the right. Using the time scaling, the three-day in vitro profile was inserted in the model as 18-day in vivo profile. Thus, we were able to use the model to make prediction of the expected in vivo plasma concentration profiles for different formulations based on the performed in vitro release test. As you can see, the differences between the test and reference formulations in the in vitro test were reflected in the simulated plasma concentration profiles. The model was also used to estimate the time needed for the AUCT to reach 80% of the AUC infinity and thus to estimate the last sampling time point in the bioequivalence study. Now let's focus on ocular drug products. The formulations that could be applied into the eye are eye drops in the form of a solution or suspension, an ointment or gel, and there is also an option to inject the formulation intravitreal. GastroPlus has developed an ocular mechanistic model where the eye is represented as a set of 13 interconnected compartments, which is shown in the figure on the right. 
the drug distributes between the compartments based on the permeability of the drug in specific compartments. Drug substance can also be bound to melanin in some compartments. The drug substance can be absorbed into the systemic circulation, and also the user has the option to include the metabolism in some compartments. The model also accounts for the formation of the tears and the drainage from the precorneal compartment to the nasolacrimal compartment and then into the gastrointestinal tract. There are some published articles describing the use of this OCAT model for evaluating the impact of formulation properties on ophthalmic bioavailability of ocular suspension and also for modeling of ocular ointment formulation. The modeling case study I'm going to present was developed for an eye ointment. The goal of the modeling was to evaluate the impact of API particle size on drug in vivo behavior and to predict bioequivalence of the test and reference formulation. First, we collected literature data on API properties and concentration profiles. Already here, we faced a challenge as there was almost no data on plasma concentrations for humans. However, we could find some data for rabbits. The data for rabbit were actually quite extensive, reporting on concentrations in different eye tissues, such as aqueous humor, conjunctiva, and iris ciliary body. However, data from different studies were not matching, even when the reporting concentrations in specific compartments after administration of the same API and same type of formulations. Nevertheless, we tried to develop the model in GastroPlus. Again, we had to decide with which dosage form to proceed, as the formulation was an ointment that would be an obvious selection. However, as the goal of modeling was to use the model to evaluate the impact of different API particle size on drug in vivo behavior, we decided to select the suspension as the dosage form in the model. The reason was that in the ointment model in GastroPlus um, does not use API particle size as model input and would therefore not be useful for us. To account for the higher viscosity of the gel compared to the suspension, we had to lower the nasolacrimal drainage rate. During the development of the model, we encountered numerous challenges. Many parameters of the model were unknown and had to be fitted or optimized. Also, we developed the model on rapid in vivo data and made predictions for humans. As mentioned before, we had to decide which specific literature data to use as there were significant differences between the reported in vivo concentrations in different studies. And in the end, the only validation of the human model were the aqueous humor data from our in vivo study. Despite all the challenges, the model was used to make an assumption about the impact of API particle size on aqueous humor CMAX and AUC, as can be seen in these two figures. CMAX is more sensitive to particle size as it decreases when mean particle size increases over 10 micrometers. AUC is less sensitive to, AUC, uh, to API particle size. I've presented you two modeling cases, one for intramuscular injection and one for eye ointment formulation. As mentioned at the beginning, there are PBIC PK models available also for other non-oral routes and can be used for making decisions during generic drug development. When thinking about using these models for regulatory purposes, that the generic industry has to pay attention to proper model development and validation and selection of model parameters. This is sometimes quite challenging as many model parameters are unknown or difficult to determine 
and there are scarce data available for model development and validation. However, I believe that generic industry will proceed to use the models for internal decision making during drug development and that eventually these models will be ready for regulatory purposes. In order for this to come true, also regulatory agencies has, have to acknowledge the possibilities that modeling of non-oral routes offers and give guidance on the requirements for model validation and possible use of models. In the end, I would like to thank all my colleagues at Sandoz, both in SDC Slovenia and globally for many scientific discussions about modeling. Here are the references used during the presentation. Thank you for listening. I will be available at the panel discussion for any questions. I'd like to thank all the speakers for the excellent talks um, and we can get ready for the panel discussion in shortly. We have Dr. Babskin and Dr. Lamardi as the moderators. Thank you very much. So as everybody gets on camera, I would like to introduce the new, uh, I mean, the, the other um, panelist members. Uh, and first of all, thank you to all of the, the presenters and the attendants for coming to this workshop. So in the panel, in addition to the three speakers today, we have um, Alam Klondoker, PhD, who is a staff fellow in the Division of Quantitative Method Modeling in the Office, Office of Research and Standard in OGD. Um, Halam's role in the division is to utilize translational tools such as PPK modeling to address specific questions pertinent to drug development process and or regulatory decision making. We also have the honor to have Robert Bees, Foundy PhD, who is a professor of pharmaceutical science at the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Science as well as a member of the Institute for Computational Data Science at the State University of New York at Buffalo. His research focuses on the application of pharmacometrics and PPK approaches and the novel method development, including machine learning approaches in dynamic systems. Darby Kozak, PhD, who is the Deputy Director, Division, uh, who is the Deputy Division Director for the Division of Therapeutic Performance, in the Office of Research and Standards, OGD, will also be with us. Uh, Darby leads a group of interdisciplinary scientists on the development of new analytical methods and equivalence evaluation methodologies for complex drug substances, and including parenteral, ophthalmic, and inhalation formulations. And finally, Ross Walenga was already with us in the previous um, uh, session, who is a chemical engineer in the Division of Quality Method and Modeling in OGD. Dr. Walenga research interest, uh, research interest includes computational free dynamics modeling for holy nail, nasal, ophthalmic, and dermal drug products to answer, to answer questions pertaining to bioequivalence. So thank you all for joining, and uh, Andrew, you have a few introduction points. Yeah, before, yeah. before we get started in some of my uh, more specific comments related to this panel, I just want to remind the audience that the chat box is there for you. You can pose any questions, even as we're going through any of our discussion topics. If you have your own opinions, we're keeping an eye on it. And if we're able to enter into the discussion, we will. So we really uh, appreciate any feedback we can get from the from the rest of the participants. Uh, pretend there's a mic stand in the middle of the room, uh, if we were all live. Uh, so I, I just want to give a like a brief explanation of this of this session and kind of some of the, the terminology may be a bit confusing when we consider some of the products that we're going to be talking about today. So yes, this is called for other locally acting products, but we're also discussing products which we won't technically uh, be called locally acting. Um, so I mean, these include, for example, like we're, we're talking about like complex injectables. So you can talk about suspensions that are um, directly delivered intramuscularly for that effect in that location, but then there's also like 
the PLGA microspheres that are delivered there as a, for a depot effect where it being that where the drugs then being delivered systemically. So, um, you know, so in that, in that case, you know, the, some of the modeling that's involved there is very much, um, linked to each other. And so it just, it begs still to discuss that in this workshop, also given just the difficulties for some of those long acting products in conducting the PK studies as is. And of course, uh, I had to plug that in a couple of months, we're gonna have a, a, another CRC workshop focusing on modeling specific for lock acting injectables. Um, so, you know, from Melian's presentation, you saw that uh, OGD has active research in a lot of different areas. Um, you can tell by just the length of some from the slides in some areas that a lot of our focus in this group of, and this group of uh, products have been on the nasal and atomic side. You know, we could have done separate symposiums on that, but you know, we had to utilize the time that we had available, and we wanted really to bring in all those products that we're doing the research on. Um, you know, sometimes our effort in some of these products are based upon just you know, just the amount of products that are been approved, or even just the amount of products on the market being used by U.S. public. Some of these other locally acting areas, um, specific dosage forms, you may only have three or four products really that have been proven in that area. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not focusing on those, but some of the research is still ongoing for that. Um, so we so so bear with us as we go through this panel. You know, we're going to be talking about a lot of different products. We may be jumping in and out of different products. Uh, but we think that there's going to be some commonalities in some of these products. Like you already heard some of these presentations about in vitro release methods. Um, a lot of products here um, where modeling be dependent on that type of data. Um, so with that, um, before we really start getting to discussion topics and to help the audience, you know, understand who our panelists are, I'm just going to briefly go around the panelists and have them describe just what the products, their work interests or research interests have have to do in the locally acting area, uh, or let's say generally in the non-oral area, um, so that the audience then knows like where everyone's expertise is coming from. So I'm just going to order as I see it on the on the screen. So Darby, thanks, Andrew. You can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, as mentioned at the intros, I'm the deputy division director of Vision Therapy Performance One, and the two teams I kind of help look after are really the parental, the ophthalmic, and otic uh, for the locally acting there in the formulations, and then also some of the inhalation and nasal drug products. So a little bit of more of a formulation scientist or analytical chemist in that area. Thank you, Darby. Alan? Hello, thank you. Uh, I work in Division of Quantitative Method and Modeling. Uh, so I oversee uh, complex injectables and uh, topical drug products. I use PVK modeling uh, to, uh, to my research and um, to my review. Thank you, Alam. Give me on. Hello. Yeah, my main research interesting area is PPPK modeling and simulation and its application. In DECO MM, my current focus is on the application of PPPK approach to some locally acting complex product, specifically ophthalmic drug product, and also with uh, interest in orally inhaled drug products. Thanks. Ross? Yeah, I, I work in DQMM with uh, uh, the others that we're, that we're speaking for. And um, my primary modeling interest is with uh, computational fluid dynamics for oral inhaled drug products, but also nasal drug products and um, dermal drug products. I've been working on some um, other similar types of models for ophthalmic drug products and trying to incorporate these models with PVK models. Hi all, uh, this is Sajeev. Uh, I work uh, with Generic Industry working for Lupin Pharmaceuticals. Uh, uh, I work in the area of uh, drug delivery design as well as uh, uh, IV, IBC for orally acting drug, uh, orally administered drug, which are local acting, as well as topical ophthalmic, including um, long acting ophthalmic formulations. Yeah. 
Rebecca. And also I would add that if you saw Rebecca's uh, presentation that she is now PhD, Dr. Rebecca. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'm coming from Sandoz, so a generic company. We're um, focusing um, our modeling on oral drug products, but I've also had some experience with intramuscular uh, products, um, eye products, as I've mentioned in my presentation, and also some transdermal products, such as patches. Or, uh. And lastly, uh, Rob. I'm Rob Bees from the State University of New York at Buffalo, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, and I've uh, focused uh, in terms of the non oral uh, drug products on PUPK modeling strategies uh, for uh, vaginally uh, administered films, cervical rings, and uh, uterine, uterine implants. Okay, so thank you very much all for describing all of your expertise. And as you can see, we have quite a broad expertise around the table, a virtual table. So we would like to start the panel discussion talking about ophthalmic formulations. And the first question will go to Ming Liang, uh, because in your presentation, you talk about the utilization of preclinical studies and especially rabbit studies. And what is the rationale to develop a preclinical pre ophthalmic models, whichever the formulation, um, as there is currently no need to have animal studies to establish bioequivalence between a test and a reference product? So we'd like to get your opinion on what do you see as using preclinical studies to, for, for B evaluation? Thanks, Maxim. That's a really great question. As you may have noticed that during my talk and also maybe another speakers, for example, Rebecca, you noticed that most of the rabbit models are related to the rabbit currently. Uh, yes, it is correct that you don't need to have animal studies to demonstrate BE between RLDs and the generics. However, Directly developing and validating human ophthalmic models is very challenging. As you all may know, that ophthalmic drugs are locally active and they may give rise to challenges in measuring drug levels. As such measurement in local eye tissues are often impractical, impractical, unethical, and cost prohibitive. Uh, on the other hand, there is a relatively rich animal ophthalmic data available, and it is also uh, feasible to obtain eye tissue PK data in preclinical species such as rabbits, which may then be used to validate animal models. Once we have uh, animal models validated, the animal ophthalmic model may be very useful in extrapolating to human models where PBPK models may play an important role since there are some similarities in eye anatomy and the physiology between human eyes and some preclinical species such as rabbit eyes. Then it is possible to mechanistically extrapolate the validated animal eye models to human models by considering the likely changes in anatomy and the physiology among different species, as those parameters are key component of PBPK models as model system parameters, as we all know. Then ultimately, the extrapolated human PBPK model may be further validated through the very limited sparse human data, if available, before it may be used for the e evaluation and the establishment. That's my brief answer. Thanks. Thank you, Ming Yang. And uh, just wondering because we have a few other experts on the um, on the in the ocular area. So, is there other member of the panel who would like to comment on that? I can actually. <laughs> Go ahead, Dobby. I always kind of come at these a bit more from, like I said, I'm more, more of an analytical chemist or a formulation scientist. So I, I was really like pleased to see some of the, the talks with Ming Liang and, and Sajiv 
where it's it's really that correlation. Like, what do we know? How much can the formulation change before we start to actually see a clinical effect or a potentially clinical effect? And I come from the kind of perspective of right now we have a potential reference standard that we can compare against and we can kind of set those sort of formulation parameters against that, you know, that known reference standard. But that may necessarily depend upon how and what lots of reference standard we get or the number that we test. Well, the model really can kind of tell us what actual critical quality attributes are going to have the biggest clinical effect. Now then let's focus on those sort of aspects and then set a design space or a range or a specification that will have actually a clinical sort of relevance to it. So you can then look at how much will the viscosity potentially change before you actually change the, the pharmacokinetics. And I think as Ming Liang really said quite well is to do that in humans is exceptionally challenging. But in the preclinical space, we have a lot more data and ability to get that data. So how do we use and really leverage that right now and then be able to then leverage it future for understand how it goes into human. So I said, that's kind of like how I really enjoyed these, these talks this afternoon, these particle sizes, these formulations, but that's very much my background and like to be able to see how these models can help with that sort of standards and, and criteria. Thanks, Darby, and I fully agree with you on that, uh, kind of using the mentality of the safe space from biopharmaplication, but for the general and PPK is where I see those model going. So. Any other comments? Yes, Savish. Saji. So, so I, I do agree with uh, Davi and Mingliang there that our experiences, uh, uh, the animal models, if not, they may not be uh, directly extrapolatable to the human uh, PK, at least a human ophthalmic PK, but then uh, at least they can provide rank order of uh, various formulations uh, manufactured, having minor differences in uh, viscosity or a vis interplay of viscosity with particle size or uh, uh, globule distribution and stuff like that. So, so I do agree uh, with both the panelists that um, uh, preclinical models are really useful in ophthalmics, uh, and it's very difficult uh, to have a human, live human model uh, working uh, uh, in productive in in predict in, in in terms of predicting uh, the behavior. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, actually, based on your points, so it. it... It is clearly a sign that preclinical studies are valuable. And to, to rebound on that, and based on Rebecca's presentation and my expertise, oh, Andrew, you had a comment? Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just want to give like a, a, a kind of additional point there because we don't, I don't have to ask this question again because the answer to this has already been in everyone's previous responses. You know, if you're thinking that. If all I have to do to establish bioequivalence with my ophthalmic product is conduct that B study in a preclinical species, um, you've now heard that you know we, we're really focusing on that these products will be bioequivalent human, and that there's these different challenges here that will make that result directly extra can be directly extrapolated uh, to human. Um, so you know, please consider that if you're if you're planning to make that argument. So one question actually about those preclinical studies, because as both Ming Liang and Darby mentioned, there are quite a lot of, at least for some compounds, quite a lot of studies out there in literature or in-house that you may have in your in your companies. But quite often we see an inter-study viability that is pretty significant. And the question would be from a regular standpoint when a company wants to submit a proposal to you or an, an NDA. Would we prefer to use all of the available uh, literature data for model development, knowing that some of those data may not be well captured by the model, and sometimes it can already be explained by the model, it could just be intensity viability. So what would be uh, the, the panel's opinion on in terms of using either all of the data or trying to pick and choose the good data and maybe have a more like a nicer package, but may not be use everything that we know out there? And Darby, if you want to start on that. <laughs> sure. I don't know if I'm the best person to answer in terms of a model, but I think this is kind of the million dollar question of, you know, I think there's the old adage of it depends really on the quality of the data that's going in, is it the quality of the model that gets created? The more data you have, obviously, 
it builds upon itself and get more verification. So I think that's kind of one perspective to it. But coming from the other, you always know that within any type of study, it depends on how the, the it was conducted, uh, what type of instrumentation, things like that. You're going to get that sort of variability that may not necessarily be uh, directly addressed and then could potentially bias the model or bias the results. And so it's kind of looking at that as a, as a go. What I saw, I think, in an earlier talk in the, the, the dermal session was using all that data, but then identifying those outliers and then starting to look at those. And hopefully what you're finding is just a few being able to better understand why and being able to then correlate back as to this is why we feel that this is not or an outlying sort of position that would not be appropriate for that sort of model. Um, I think there's always desires or wishes that we'd have for all these types of studies, at least some sort of reference that could be used and be able to help us correlate in their studies from different groups to make it that more robust. But that's going to be something that's a bigger sort of dream. But I mean, I, I kind of hand over to really the modeling experts when you guys are looking at and sort of pulling this sort of data, what are the key sort of things and concerns that would be raised there, especially building and validating these. So therefore, I'm looking more at uh, Ming Liang, Ross, or Rebecca, if you have any comments on the question. Um, yeah, so... Oh, go ahead. Can I, go ahead, uh, Rebecca, okay. and then Ross. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, this is the million dollar question, as mentioned before, because um, it doesn't really matter for which product or for which formulation we are developing the, the model. We always try to gather as much data as we can. And it, it, this is often the, the question, which one to use should be used, all of them to, to develop and to validate the model or, and um, to have bigger prediction errors or to just use a, a part of, of the data that somehow fits better to our model and use those to validate our model and have great prediction errors all below 10 percent and and um, we think okay regulatory would be uh, happy with with those prediction errors but um, my my opinion would be it's better to to collect all the data and to make some a scientific decision which one to include and which one to discard based on the knowledge you can gather and um, the scientific decision you can make make based on all the available data. Um, so if this means sometimes the predictions error are greater, um, we, we have to go with that one. And Ross? Um, yeah, I agree with what Rebecca saying and, and Darby too. Um, I feel like if you've got the data, it's it seems kind of wrong to just ignore it because unless you have some basis to reject it, um, there could be something there that you're missing, something that your model doesn't capture. If there's some data that falls well without, well outside of your prediction, um, but I also look at it as an opportunity when you've got data like these, is that it, it can lead you to understand what your model might be missing. Um, <clears throat> maybe there's some so say you've got data from rabbits, you might have data from one species of rabbit and data from another species, and maybe there's interspecies differences or, or something else. So I, I look at it as a potential opportunity too. Thanks, Ross. And the last question is actually um, a question I had for Ming Yang to start, and it, it, will, it will echo some of the comments that are in the chat right now. Um, in the chat, we are talking about how close we are from being able to demonstrate bioequivalence in the ophthalmic space using those uh, PPK models. And really, Ming Yang, I would like uh, so so then we can close up the ophthalmic parenthesis and go to the new of um, root of administrations. But what is your vision on the role for PPK ocular models in the near future to establish B and Either it could be done directly or maybe helping you to establish bees. So what is the vision you have currently for those specific models? Thank you uh, for the question. That's also like very hard question to answer, I believe. But there are some like unique challenges in the atomic PPPK model or like the data. As for the previous question, as many uh, panelists 
have already commented on, I totally agree. There are some unique challenge, for example, internal data or the data even submitted to for regulatory usage or whatever, you know. Uh, let's say for Robbie, there are some like unique feature. So different different kinds of rapid and also different ways of deal with the rapid uh, from lab to labs. And also, you know, once they let's say they, they drop topically applied to eye surface, they, the way you deal with the animal may also affect how long the drops and stay on the eye because there are some like blink. I, I blink something, so many like challenge factor here, but even though there exists some challenges here, but in the recent years, uh, good for funded research have supported like several research, including modeling, also including the measurement, as I briefly mentioned in, the, uh, in my presentation, we have a, like much better understanding, I, I would say compared to many years ago before this effort. For example, for the suspension formulation, we are now getting much better understanding uh, on the effect of, for example, the formulation particle size distribution, viscosity. Um, we are like getting more and more better understanding in this area. I would say eventually, uh, as we all work together, all the stakeholders, including generic industry, regulatory agencies, and also academia, everybody work together. I would say in the near future, we could use that as a totality of evidence to support the bioequivalence in the uh, regulatory submission. And the, ultimately, uh, we hope once we have a better understanding and the then we may have uh, like the use it as a potential tool in lieu of the uh, comparative clinical endpoint study. That's our goal, but we need much more effort in this area. Thanks, Mingyang. And then one last quick question directly to, to uh, Sajiv. Uh, because in your presentation, you talked about topical and um, intraocular administration. So do you see a role of using PPK models for those non-topical ocular products? Yeah, yeah, definitely yes. Uh, but then uh, it could be a lot simpler than uh, those 13 compartment or uh, more uh, models actually. So because uh, what we are looking at is a generic product, uh, which is Q1, Q2 to reference product already like, so that is already established. So what well, now, what are now lo we looking at as what are those subtle uh, manufacturing variables like sequence of addition of ingredients or uh, the autoclaving or the filtration process or the hold times and and stuff or the particle size reduction techniques that are getting that are being employed which can influence uh, the overall uh, uh, physicochemical property the static property of the formulation say the viscosity or the osmolarity and stuff like that which in turn can interact with the physiological uh, systems when topically administered so 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 from from in compared to an nda product development for an nda product development uh, the scope of investigation becomes a little more limited and and then from that perspective uh, the pbpk model where uh, uh, the validation requirement of the model is clearly defined uh, would be really useful. And in fact, I would go one step forward that in some of the uh, glaucoma products, a PKPD, PB, PKPD modeling is also possible on animals, like because we do have uh, very established intraocular lowering uh, uh, models uh, is, uh, established for rabbits, which, uh, which, which give you very accurate uh, rank relationship between uh, formulations varying in different uh, uh, formulation or manufacturing uh, parameters. Okay, thank you. And just one last point on that uh, ocular PPK PD model. Uh, one consideration that we haven't talked about is the, um, the target expression level between preclinical species and human that may be different 
So one extra consideration when we talk about extrapolation for those PD models. Okay. So with that, we are closing the ocular ophthalmic chapter. And Andrew, uh, your turn. All right, thank you, Max. Um, my first questions are actually going to go to uh, Dr. V's on the, the PBK model development for the re female reproductive tract. Um, Dr. Bees, could you could you uh, explain what role you think PBK Mai could play in supporting the bioequivalence assessments for these type of products, such as uh, uterine implants? And also, could you highlight what you see as any significant challenges and data gaps you see in developing these models? I, I think the PBK uh, approach is going to be critical uh, for uh, uterine and, and, and vaginal products for bioequivalence. Uh, the uterine products typically have a may, may have a, a a long may may have a, a, a peripheral measurements you can you can make uh, to 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 help with evaluation of this, but you want to know you you need to get insights about local uh, local local concentrations, and you also have a situation where to do a clinical endpoint study or to evaluate some of these long term long release agents that the studies are are are, are entirely impractical for a uh, for generic um, competitor to enter uh, in, in, in into those formulations, the modeling products can give insight on on um, on key measures and key elements that can be propagated to 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 help to 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 facilitate and make more efficient the uh, study designs necessary to establish bioequivalence in terms of the local um, uh, it, more local administration. For example, HIV prevention in the with with vaginal films or or or, or rings, um, again, knowing local local tissue concentrations, being able to predict these, uh, and whether or not the levels are protective, are are uh, with 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 the generic competitor would be would be uh, would be would be critical, and would I think modeling would in particular PVPK and possibly PVPK PD modeling uh, would be critical for. Uh, providing insight in that area in terms of how to proceed with with uh, with 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 a bio, with 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 the bioequivalence, basically a model based bioequivalence sort of strategy. In terms of the challenges and and uh, and gaps, uh, getting appropriate tissue measurements of uh, of these uh, of, of those concentrations is 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 is, is rather difficult. The the uh, the animal models typically used are, are non human primate. And so they 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 are difficult also to to uh, to 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 implement and limited um, in 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 how many th in what 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 can what can be done. Uh, some of the things we're building towards with the with the contractor to begin making measurements in or continue making measurements in human get a sense of the variability and you know, variability came up in, in in tissue size distributions and and tissue characteristics um, are. I think a critical a critical component and, and 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 a gap currently. Um, the uh, I think also refinement of experimental techniques to obtain those concentrations to try to, to avoid outliers that are an artifact of the experimental or the sampling technique as opposed to an actual representative sample or or, or some of those those key challenges. Thank you for that response. Now let's. Uh... Consider a different aspect of these type of products on where a critical aspect of these is going to be the vitro is well, it's the vivo release, but a lot oftentimes we're measuring the in vitro release. Um, so what sorry, I forgot his question. Um, what do you think are the best conditions for assessing in vitro release characteristics that are scalable to in vivo for uterine implants, several ring formulations, and vaginal film formulations? Now, before I fully uh, hand over that question to you, Dr. Mies. Um, I would also note that any other people can respond to this question in, in regards to other products where we think that these in vitro release tests and their scalability to in vivo play a critical role. Um, these could be more controlled release type formulations like the PLGA microspheres, other type of implants, and even to agree ophthalmic ointments. Um, so any, any comments that people have on being able to apply this in vitro data or even mechanistic models that even try to get to the heart of that formulation and describe that release um, you can add but we'll first start with uh, Dr. Beeson for the for the ones that are acting the female reproductive track 
I think well, one of one of the, the the key aspects in particular for the for the for the implants is is is, a, is to to consider a um, uh, in vitro release system where the 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 uh, solutions used are bio relevant solutions, and one of the challenges as well is that they tend to be very very small volumes as well. So I know that the, the, the perhaps uh, you know the, the the at least evaluating panels of 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 of, of uh, of uh, of these um, by relevant uh, conditions are, are going to be are going to be quite important. A particular challenge that arises is if you want to make it completely by relevant, you may actually have a milieu that encourages uh, bacterial growth, for example, that sort of thing. So you you've got to uh, do, uh, maybe address those address those kind of trade offs. So having data from um, the in vivo. Uh, release in terms of mount remaining in, in, for example, in the implants that was documented um, in the uh, in the in the in the NDAs for these for these for these for these products is very very helpful in terms of mapping the uh, in vitro release characteristics uh, measured the time frame of the in vitro release rates and how they might map to some of these longer periods as it has been documented that there appears to be sort of a stepped reduction in the release rate over uh, over over time in the in the originator product. So, I, th I think there are multiple elements that come into play there. So. Okay, Darby. Yeah, no, I can chime in. I think that definitely it, it makes a lot of sense. What Robert was saying is the especially for like the real time and be able to predict for in vivo. The more you can simulate or better simulate the the release media that would be potentially in vivo definitely helps. I think one of the biggest challenges that we always face though, especially for some of the long acting intrauterine that lasts for five years, that a, a you know two to five year IVRT study then becomes an exceptional challenge to kind of not only perform, but to be able to do over time and then to submit. And so then what you need to start looking at is what is the, the mechanism of release and what would be an appropriate sort of accelerate condition that you can then start to mimic. And then I think you need to use the model to kind of go back to how does that understanding the mechanism of release and the overall model of its release rate then go back to that in vitro, then stepping back then to the in vivo. So you do have a few sort of bridges there, but I think those to me are some of the other aspects that are the real challenges for some of these, these especially long acting drug products where you have a rate controlling membrane or something else like that, where you can kind of better predict the release rate, but last for years on an on a order or time. No, I, I agree. And I, I think understanding that mapping and, and, and whether or not uh, those conditions are really sort of representative in mapping time scales is, 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 is a challenge and really, I think, points to you need to think about it's thinking about those the, the the sort of first principles rationalism and then what is the what are the experimental designs that help give us confidence in those first principles that we've implemented all right any other takers on that question all right Alan? so i i think that yeah we we always want to determine the in vitro release of drug in, uh, that would be biopredictive. Uh, but uh, the question is that how would we know that uh, the release assay or the method uh, you are using is biopredictive? So one way uh, we can utilize the model here is that uh, if the drug is uh, uh, drug is and if the drug uh, from the formulation is the rate limiting step and the absorption is immediately happening after the drug is released from the formulation. So, if you can uh, apply the deconvolution of the PK profile, then your uh, deconvoluted profile should uh, mimic the in vitro release profile. So, in that way, you can say that whether your uh, method you are applying to measure the in vitro release is by predictive or not. So I, I see that some uh, role in model can play here. Well, and the model may also be able to account for physiologic conditions that may, uh, that may violate the assumption of immediate absorption. Uh, for example, in the uterine space, you have fluid production and resorption that's going on all the time. And that may, that may need to be accounted for to, 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 
be able to do that kind of mapping uh, with a greater with a greater level of confidence. All right. Anyone else? Before we move to the next topic, uh, I just want to like kind of summarize there that I, I agree with some of the concepts that were laid out there. It's really breaking from the traditional way we think of IV IVC, where direct in vitro input is giving your it, it predicting your in vivo release rate or absorption, and that gets your prediction is more about building the models around the formulation itself and understanding how that data, vitro data is telling you about the formulation and how that can be integrated then into your in vivo model. Um, not, not quite a little bit different than the traditional IVIVC, um, but one way that modeling could be used. Uh, okay, so one one type of product that we haven't discussed yet in this panel is on the nasal drug products. Um, so Ross, um, what do you see the role of modeling simulation understanding the performance of nasal drug products that target nose to brain delivery? And for those of you who aren't familiar, what we're talking about here for nose to brain delivery, we're actually referring to those to certain products that actually have targeted regional deposition or claim to have targeted regional deposition. Um, yeah, thank you for the question, Andrew. Uh, I think it's a really uh, exciting area. It seems to be an emerging uh, product application. There's a lot of uh, research out there for drugs that are intended to target um, CNS uh, diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, uh, via the nasal route. Um, as of now, there's two products that are approved for treating migraines, although um, those nasal products, it's not necessarily proven yet that um, it's direct nose to brain delivery, or if it's just coming through absorption through the, the nasal uh, epithelia to the systemic uh, circulation. Um, <clears throat> but anyhow, for a, a product that were to be approved where we know for sure that the drug was targeting uh, nose to brain drug delivery via the, the olfactory region, I, I think modeling would be, could be a very important part of um, both understanding um, how the product works, coming up with um, uh, Product specific guidance from, from our perspective, um, just because it, it, it would be very difficult to um, use a PK study, just a, a straight systemic PK study, I think, to infer um, that the product was uh, appropriately targeting um, brain, the, the brain in the way that the reference product is intended. Um, so I think that would be the key component that the, the modeling could help uh, elucidate. Thank you, Ross. And um, unfortunately, time is flying. And uh, as Andrew mentioned at the beginning, we could have individual session on all of those routes of administration. So we have one last question, and I would like to start with both Rebecca and Sajif right now. Um, when you're developing a PBK model for locally acting drug, uh, and Rebecca, you mentioned quite a lot in your presentations, what are the risks that you are perceiving um, to submit those models to the authority. And then after you made your comments, I would like to invite Alam to give a comment from the regulatory standpoint on those. So maybe Rebecca first. Uh, the risk regarding the development of um, models for, for locally acting drug, right? Exactly, yeah. from, from like from the industry perspective to the, like the, the what could be the limitation for you to actually develop those models uh, instead of doing other approaches? Okay, um, so it depends on on what uh, specific um, locally acting drug you are focusing. But with regards to what I've presented in my in my cases, I see the problems with with um, like we mentioned before, various literature data um, inconsistent between uh, each other. So you have to decide with which one to go or to have higher prediction errors. Then th another problem I see is that for men, we have models for, for many different um, oral, um, non-oral dosage routes, but there are many parameters of the models, either physiological um, that that are unknown or difficult to measure, and most of them are, are usually just some optimized values, or we have to optimize a lot of values to get a, a model that fits to our data. And it's difficult to decide how many parameters can we optimize. I mean, 
every time you are developing a model, you try to to optimize as little as possible and to use default values, but then how also those default values were set by someone. And if we don't have um, in vitro data or measured data from any in vivo study, they those were just set values by, by someone actually. Um, and another challenge I see is um, for, for any long acting um, product we mentioned before that we have to have a good in vitro test to represent the in vivo behavior, especially with regards to the comparison of test and reference formulations. And those tests has to be bio relevant and also bio predictive. So we can we can be sure about um, the the difference that the, the test tells us is also um, will be observed in vivo. So I think those would be the main points from my side. Thanks, Rebecca. And maybe Sajif, if you want to rebound on that. Yeah, of course, I would uh, add on to whatever Rebecca has said. Uh, one one dilemma is how much of pre work is required uh, or the proof of concept work is required before uh, you can seek scientific advice. Uh, uh, so, and, and at what scale of the formulation manufacturing you sh you can uh, go ahead and uh, do that proof of concept. So an R and D scale uh, product uh, based proof of concept at, at some in most instances probably may not be uh, accepted during the scientific advice discussions uh, for the simple reason that the process is not yet scaled up. Uh, so so the, most of the manufacturing variables have not yet it been properly studied or established and then an in vivo proof and a model based on that probably is less acceptable. So, so one big dilemma that all of us have while developing generic product is that how much of that, at what stage we should uh, actually approach and with what type of data we should approach and to what extent uh, that proof of concept should be uh, established beyond doubt. Uh, uh, and, and, the, and, 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 and the guidance around that probably would help uh, or encourage more uh, uh, generic uh, companies to proactively pursue uh, this uh, PBPK based modeling and uh, doing more uh, preclinical in vivo studies to correlate in vitro uh, parameters. Thank you, Sajiv. So, is there anyone from the FDA that wants to comment on this, uh, on those responses? Alam? Yes, Alam, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so my perspective would be a little different from the industry scientist. Uh, I can share my perspective from the regulatory aspect. Uh, so the question is that what you are trying to achieve with your PBK modeling. So the, depending on that question, so risk assessment would be a little different. In regulatory space, we often see uh, the use of PBK model in the virtual bioequivalence uh, framework. So uh, the question is that whether you have the right model structure uh, to uh, describe the disposition of drug through the uh, relevant physiology or local physiology and whether you are uh, incorporating the uh, formulation attributes like uh, particle size or viscosity or other uh, important key formulation attributes into the PVK model. Uh, if you are using the PVK model uh, for the virtual bioequivalence, then the question would be that whether you are able to separate the formulation difference uh, from the physiological variability. And if you are making any assumption in your model, uh, what are the risks you are bringing in uh, or whether you are inflating the type 1 error? So we, can, we want to see some kind of risk assessment in that space. Thanks, Adam. Is there any more comments? Yes, Mingyang, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just one quick comment on the on the response from Rebecca and the Sajiv. I think, yeah, I understand it, you know, as we just mentioned, there are many challenge area in atomic modeling uh, however, there also exists some opportunities. We should uh, look at it another way. Uh, a response to your question, at what stage? Uh, I would say, like at 
even like a planning or developing stage of your generic product, you could communicate with FDA uh, through controlled correspondence or pre and meetings. There are many pathways. I know there currently there is low direct guidance from product specific guidance on this topic. However, there are also another pathways which you can communicate with us even at an early stage of your generic drug products. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Ming Yang. So uh, because of the time, I guess we will stop the panel discussion right now. Thank you to all of the panelists and the presenters for today. Thank you for all of you for joining this third session of the first day of this workshop. Uh, we are looking forward to talking to all of you tomorrow. And I would like to um, let Lucy Fang uh, take the lead now for the closing remarks on this first day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Remember, turn off your video and mute. Thank you.